five actors will keep going. So just to give a context in case anybody joined, uh, we are <coughs> kind of still looking at uh, the cyberstyle steel challenge, the segmentation, instant segmentation challenge, and then uh, since multiple of us have made submissions and are more interested in uh, kind of trying to achieve higher scores, we are now in the process of evaluating some ideas of what people who are winners have implemented. And then in the process, we came across three papers, PSPNet, DeepLab V3 Plus, and uh, HRNet, which are kind of like the state of the art for instant segmentation. Today, they have the best scores on a bunch of benchmarks. So we are kind of in the process of going through those papers last week we discussed PSPNet. So as I mentioned, uh, we can get a quick update if anybody had any progress in, on the actual uh, competition and then uh, get into either the code or uh, since the paper DeepLab V3 Plus or V3 is fairly complicated, we can kind of go towards discussing that. So that's at least the agenda for today. Uh, any updates from anyone? Steve, Rachel, Mill, nope. Joseph, anybody? Um, I haven't done any submissions this week, but um, yeah, so like now I'm sort of familiar with how Catalyst worked. I've been just sort of trying the different segmentation models that they have and like trying different backbones on them. Um, so yeah, I was out running the, the PSP net with, with ResNet. Um, as I say, it, it seems to work sort of twice as fast as anything else, but it maybe doesn't end up giving you as good dice scores. Plus, as well as I ran it with all the different forms of ResNet, and like ResNet 50 was giving me the best results. And then I tried it. The winner. You're breaking up towards the end. We lost you. Net with UNet, so I tried UNet, but it gave good results. So I've like now switched on to trying to use efficient. Oh, Steve, Sorry. your connection seems to have problem because uh, we are losing you towards the end of what you said. Like you, we heard you say efficient net, but then lost the rest of what you mentioned. Yeah, so I just switched to using U. Yeah, so efficient net. Sorry, uh, we're losing you quite a bit. Could only hear the last word. Yeah, so I've just switched to using UNet with efficient. Ah, okay. Uh, but basic, but uh, uh, basic doing. unit or uh, uh, a ResNet based unit. So, yeah. Okay, uh, I don't know what I can do about that. Um, reconnect. So. Okay, let's see. Because yeah, there's. Uh, can anybody, everybody, hear me clearly, or am I? Yes, we can. Hear you. I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. We'll give Steve a minute. I guess Steve is using the vanilla version of the PSP net. And last time, the library that you shared, Srinivas, that has a vanilla PSP net as well as a PSP net with a unit type decoder. That's what I've been trying to get it implemented in FastAI too. Ah, OK. But yes, I got distracted with the deep lab paper. And then, yeah, I just didn't make progress there. But Yeah, <laughs> so deep lab. we'll get into deep lab. It's kind of pretty deep. <laughs> I've also looked at DeepLab V3 because that is kind of the native segmentation yeah. that is used in iOS currently. I see. So, so that's why that that has more kind of interest for me. Mm -hmm. There's a unit plus plus in the references. Has anyone seen that, or does anyone know what that is? In the references from DeepLab V3. I'm not sure. One of the papers have like a unit plus plus mentioned, and I was curious. Like I've never seen that before. Yeah, neither have I. That sounds interesting. Steve, uh, go ahead. Let's see. 
whether we can hear you now. See, uh, we see your back. Can you say something? Can you hear us? Hello, Steve. Maybe you can say something on the chat. Let's see. Um, still can't hear or I don't hear Steve speaking. Uh, meanwhile, just a quick update before we dive into the papers. Um, the one thing I did try the last week um, <clears throat> is uh, because I was still using the kernels available from Kaggle, I was still on fast AI version one. So the default optimizer is that I was using was not uh, Radom, but just Adam or Adam W, if you will. And so I kind of threw in the Radom optimizer code and saw what the results would be. But uh, either because I changed a few parameters that were default um, or whatever, it came close, but again, it didn't exceed and I didn't break Steve's record of getting past 0.90. I was still 0 0.88, 0 0.878 or something. So just FYI, um, random optimizer and um, mesh activation are the two changes that happen in between FastAI and FastAI or between FastAI version one and version two. Version two uses random as default and the mesh activation and I thought those would be interesting things since they are throwing options that you can try very quickly without a lot of change in code. I did try it. It gave me as good, but very close to the same results I saw. But again, I haven't tweaked the parameters and that's something I'm going to try this week. Just FYI. So I did throw that in there to try and get a better uh, result, but didn't get very far. Got close, but no, not beyond. Um, so let's see is Steve is I think he's still logged out or trying to reconnect, I guess. So um, do we want to take a quick look at the code of PSPNet or should we defer that and dive into the paper and then maybe come back to the code next week when um, I, I haven't had a chance to implement it or play with in, in fast AI and play with it. So I'm open to just discussing the Deep Lab V3 paper and then getting back to the PSPNet code, um, if that's okay. Or we can just take a quick glance at the code and then uh, jump into the paper, whatever people feel would be the best use of our time. Any comments, inputs? If we don't have working code, that we can kind of step through and look at. We'll kind of get bogged down, I feel. My yeah, book, that was my paper. concern too. Okay, so then let's look at, uh, so we may, uh, as Steve pointed out, I was a version behind. Uh, so I'll open up my PDF. Give me a minute while I start sharing and we look at the Deep Lab V3 paper, and as Steve pointed out, the version that we are actually trying to implement or the best results is the V3 Plus. So, with that said, let me try and share my screen while I have that. Let's see, I think this is the one. Okay, can you folks see? Yep. Okay, so just um, for reference, since Steve mentioned 
is with that uh, Steve joining back. Okay, I can hear um, if in the chat, since I can't monitor easily, if people can. I think he's me. back now. Can you hear us, Steve? Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I can hear you. I'm not sure if you can hear me. I'm on my phone now. Yeah, can yes, hear. we can hear you loud and clear now. All right. Uh, oh. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think it's my Wi Fi has gone funny today. Ah, okay. So, uh, Steve, really quick, um, I mean, it, uh, basically I just said I tried the RADAM optimizer and then uh, uh, interest of time, we are not jumping into the PSP net code because uh, nobody has it fully implemented and understood. So we are kind of jumping into the Deep Lab V3 paper. And I was just saying, uh, as you pointed out, the correct paper for the Deep Lab V3 plus is uh, a different one than what I had uh, uh, bookmarked or uh, I also have that downloaded. I think, uh, can you folks see that I've switched the paper? Yeah. Yep. So this is the one that you pointed to, Steve, but um, I'm going to start at the rethinking address since that's the one I went through more fully and it kind of there's an incremental improvement beyond that, I think, with Deep Lab V3 Plus. And I think, in fact, as you can see, I started with that paper, but then I switched probably because I wanted to get a better idea of what address convolutions are to begin with. And in fact, I'm finding the need, I might need to go back even more to the original Deep Lab V3 paper. So anyway, we'll start in the middle and then go backwards or forwards as necessary to get a better understanding, if that's okay with people. So this is the Deep Lab V3 Plus is kind of the second best results currently, if you will, in the instant segmentation scores of various benchmarks. I think the best one is HRNet, which came out, or at least the version that is scoring the best is uh, updated and published this year in March or April. Uh, and the Deep Lab V3 Plus, which Steve pointed to, is the best one but we'll start here since this paper has most of the ideas that are implemented and and i believe they've improved on this in the plus version so we should be able to jump to the plus version very quickly if we can get this thing under the belt um last week we discussed psp net which had the pyramid scheme of um looking at the <clears throat> image at different feature levels, uh, at different uh, scales, if you will, and this kind of uh, expands on that. So I'll just go through, feel free to interrupt and point out if there are significant details I'm missing or uh, important things that we need to understand. Um, I tend to highlight as I read along to just <clears throat> see which uh, things are new or what are important. Um, as they say, the V3, this is the V3, Deep Lab V3, uh, but not V3 Plus. And it improves because it gets rid of, and if somebody already knows it and can explain, then feel free. But this dense CRF is post-processing is eliminated. I have not understood what the dense CRF post-processing is. Um, if anybody else wants to comment on it, feel free to jump in. Um, the Atros, con or I don't know what the, is it Atros or Atros or Atros convolution is the dilated convolution. And that is explained here in this picture. Um, and they introduced the term rate as well. Unfortunately, uh, they don't define rate. And I had to read the rest of the paper before I understood that this is just a kind of a conceptual explanation, but does not actually uh, explain the details. Um, so what do I mean by that? I mean, what I mean is that uh, the rate of one means that every pixel in the image is actually uh, included in the feature map. 
um, when the filters are uh, or the kernels are moved over the original image. In the case of rate equals six, and this is what threw me and kind of what I say here, I don't get what rate means. So I'll explain it right now because that confused me until I got to the details. But essentially rate implies uh, uh, that you tend to take one of every six pixels and when you do a eight rows convolution and that's what uh, in both dimensions. Um, you take one of every six pixels and we'll get to a more accurate picture or a mathematical representation of what it represents and a rate of 24. And obviously the reason this is just a conceptual picture is they couldn't show 24 pixels along the X and Y dimension and fit it within the image. Um, so that's what this rate of 24 means. That is you take one out of every 24 pixels in the horizontal as well as the vertical dimensions. Um, so I answered my own question, but it was frustrating to look at it and try to grasp it right here because they introduce the concept, but they don't explain it, which is editorial comment, a uh, lot of the problem with this paper. Just to add, that. sorry, Shreva, just to add something, the way I look at that is, it's still the same convolution kernel size. It's still a three by three in all the three cases. So you have three weights. And what you're trying to do when rate is equal to six is you introduce rate minus one zeros between these filter rates. Correct, exactly. And in fact, that is essentially what they explain here with this mathematical equation. Oh, and right. until I got to this math equation, I couldn't figure out the diagram above because the diagram could have explained it but they did not, I wish they had a separate picture which just explained it accurately. So what you're saying rectal is exactly what is explained here, right? You introduce convolving the input X with up sample filters produced by inserting R minus one zeros right. between two consecutive filter values along each spatial dimension. And I said, it was only when I got here that I really understood what the previous picture showed. Yeah, okay. Right. So that was kind of frustrating since it took me two pages to understand and I get blocked when I can't understand a fundamental concept. But anyway, my problem. Um, so that's the key to Etos and as Rekil has explained, I think in a couple of different forums now, the important thing is the fact that it allows us to have a higher receptive field. That means we can look at more, more of the image while not changing the number of weights or parameters. Because remember that we are still using a three by three. And that's the important idea that the number of parameters don't change, but we are able to look at a larger portion of the image. That's the benefit of these atrous convolutions or dilated convolutions. Right. Um, and they obviously, um, here they try to explain that uh, they are combining multiple ideas in this paper to implement a combination of ideas. So we have looked at this spatial pyramid pooling in the PSP net paper, which is what I was talking about of taking, uh, and again, we'll look at it in the next diagram. Uh, taking in, looking at the image at different scales. And then also using encoder decoder structure, which is another idea taken from the unit paper. So it again in, uh, exploits the multi scale features from the encoder part and recovers the spatial resolution from the decoder part. So we will look at this in the very next picture as well. And then, um, and so this is done in addition to the eight rows convolution and then third extra modules are cascaded on top of the original network for capturing long range information. That's this part and spatial pyramid pooling, which is the PSP net part. And they apply the 
not only the atros convolutions but atros convolutions at different rates and they are all combined and batch normalization is applied apparently one of the key differences from the original deep lab paper to the deep lab version 3 is this addition of batch norm layers so that uh, which get trained along with the uh, filtered weights so that's an important uh, enhancement from deep lab, basic deep lab to deep lab v3 so as you can see in this paper they kind of talk about four different ideas all of which they combine so i'll go from things i understand to things i don't quite get uh spatial pyramid pooling is what they implemented or what has been implemented in psp net or at least that's what i think until i get to the code i wanted to see whether it's the same as what it's talked about in psp net or it's slightly different uh i believe it's pretty much the same as of currently unless somebody else has read the paper disagrees um the atros convolution as i mentioned and as rekel explained it's a way to get a wider receptive field while going deeper by going deeper is meant i think um bigger and bigger receptive fields um <clears throat> now how they combine the atros re resolution images is something that i still need uh, some more clarity on or how they combine that with the spatial pyramid pooling wasn't entirely clear uh, to me how do uh, they combine the various uh, layers if you will or how they combine the various rates at which the atros convolve uh then of course the third idea is encoder decoder this is something that we have all seen in the unit and dynamic unit paper that is we pass on from the encoding forward it to the decoding layer and up sample as we go back up or go back down um this is another way to provide the context of the full image at multiple levels to the decoding layer and then this image pyramid is some other concept that they introduce and my understanding of it and if anybody else is read to the paper chime in please is that this is something that they introduce again in this paper don't believe it's there in the basic deep lab v3 but it is something which um well again how they merge is something which is not very clear but essentially it's introducing the higher level scale of the image directly into the decoding layer so all of these four methods if you will are different ways of providing higher level context of the image to lower level uh, resolutions and thereby retain image context while understanding the details of the image because one of the things that happen when you go through the encoder is the fact that you are shrinking the image size and so your resolution uh, or uh, so your h by w gets smaller and smaller and therefore you know you lose the context which is which exists in this high level image so there are multiple ways of combining the higher level context with the lower level detail and there are four different ways they share here one is the encoder decoder so you pass along the encoder uh, values at different levels of resolution the second is the psp net idea of uh doing combining uh, uh, or creating pyramid pooling and then combining those uh, pyramid pooling layers the third idea that uh, these guys have come up with is atros convolution not just a single one but doing it at multiple rates and then combining them um, this is where how they combine is unclear to me at this point but something to look at in the details of the paper and then taking the high level resolution uh, sorry high level context of the image and directly again combining it at the low level that they refer to it as an image pyramid 
um, and they use all of these four techniques in various combinations in the rest of the paper to get the results that they do. Any comments? Anyone? Reichel, Steve? Anybody who has read the paper? Hello, everybody there? Down the convolution, you basically become smaller and smaller. That's what they mean by deeper. Yes. So it's like deeper layers. Deeper right. layers. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, if you look, uh, the other thing that the way I kind of think of all these three are, if you look at image pyramid, just look at the topmost layer after the merge. Uh, think of this that one. size. Yeah, exactly. Think of that size. And if you look at spatial pyramid pooling, again, the yeah. topmost that size. And if you look at Atros, all the ones but for the last one, which is called image, think of that size. All these are equal and the units last one on the decoder size, the way I think of them, all these are signed of the same size. So you're and, saying, if I can, for a minute, you're saying that one, which is mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this, that, mm -hmm. that. Not that, all those, in fact. All of these. Right, other than the and last And that one. Exactly. Are exactly. all the same size. By size is meant H by W in an image, correct? Right, yes, yes. Okay. That's what my understanding is. And the trick is you're basically trying to do what you said, different scales, different resolutions, try to bring in information from all of them. So the pyramid is basically saying, go down, just use basically a ResNet, let's say, and you'll end up with some size at the end of the convolutions. Right, now, like that one. Right. Yeah, exactly. And now the image pyramid basically is saying, why not give it the scale of 256 by 256? You'll get everything so-called on that scale. So you'll get and that which is the kind of the original scale of the image or ah, the one below that, right? Before the merge happens. This one. Yeah, that one. Scale two is basically saying, how about we resize this whole thing to 128 by 128. And that's the one you will get for image scale by two at the end of that before the merge again. Here. Right. And now you can keep going like that, right? Why not? Let's try 64 by 64. Yeah, you can just keep going this exactly. way. So that's how you're trying to encompass different scales. And then when you merge them up, which is let's for now just assume that you're upsampling everything back to the same size. So that's what the image pyramid I understand does. Encoder decoder we've seen in units right. kind of brings back the same idea. You just go round about and then just keep stacking things. Right. With uh, Atris or Itru, whatever. Uh, the way I see that is again, on the left hand side, yes, the way you're pointing your mouse, you get those different resolutions as you go down the ResNet. Now, like we just, like my understanding is that the right hand side, those images are all the same size. And the trick to get that would be, you kind of are applying these, per se, bigger convolution windows and bigger kernel size windows. So that's how you're getting like bigger images from these so-called smaller, chunks of information. And that is kind of, that's the way they bring different scales into the picture. Yeah, so Atros brings higher receptive field and therefore this size by applying this filter, but to larger receptive fields. Right, but if, if I'm not wrong, that red filter, those are marked, those are applied all on the left side images to get the uh, right yeah side. yeah so right. We, yeah. you mean you mean actually this particular little red is applied to right. that image to get the result there right exactly yeah and spatial pyramid pouring like we saw last time they say instead of going all the way fully deep down the convolution let's stop somewhere halfway in between or something and from there they decide to do this again sort of like a pyramid idea right you're looking at different resolutions and yes yeah. Then they slap them all back together. Yeah. So that was in PSP net. If I can just for people who may not have seen the last, this is the PSP net idea. So you get the convolution and then you do different scales and then combine this one along with these up samples. Right, so that's the PSP net version of combining context as compared to, so that's this spatial pyramid, the Atros we just went through, we are familiar with this because of UNET and as Rekil just explained, this is just, hey, let's take the full-sized image and 
some version scaled of it and then you can keep going right ways to get different scales and then just merge them. So assuming, yeah, so the important thing, I guess, Rekil, that you pointed out, which I didn't intuitively grasp is potentially this size, when I'm pointing, I'm saying just after the merge, uh, and how the merge happened was something that wasn't clear to me, whether you, you just do up sample or something, but assuming you do up sample in all cases, mm -hmm. this, this, uh, and, and of course these are merged at different levels. So, but this one, then all of these and the various versions of these, which all merge here, they are all of the same size and then they get merged or concatenated, if you will, with the convolution along this path at some point, correct? Yeah, sort of something like that, yeah. That's... Yeah, yeah. So I think the details of the merge were uh, what was somewhat unclear, but I guess we'll find out as we go through the paper. Okay, so, and then obviously as with anything else, they talk about, oh, and they talk about this atrospatial pyramid pooling, which is just another way of saying you do the atros convolution, which the atros convolution, as Rachel just explained is, you can get a bunch of different rates and they will give you all of this. And then you can also do the pyramid version of it and get at different scales, right? Uh, so that's, you know, the atros spatial pyramid pooling method, I would imagine. Is that right, uh, Rachel? Is that your understanding too? Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. I think there's a figure below which kind of shows that, if I'm not wrong. Okay, yeah. Let's get to it. Yeah. Um, so, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes, we can. Um, sorry, I'm getting some feedback myself. But, um, the four different types of architecture they're showing. Um, are those actually included in this um, deep lab model? From the from the other paper, I thought that they were only doing the atrospatial spatial pyramid pooling, um, which is effectively like the, those last two images, C and D, combined together, and they don't have the first two. Because in the V3 plus paper, it is effectively sticking in the encoder decoder part. So yeah. I thought that the V3 was was only atrospatial spatial pyramid pooling. Um, in this paper, at least, I uh, what I can definitely say, Steve, is they include the image pyramid for sure. Um, whether they include the encoder decoder, I don't completely recall, but I can vouch for the fact because they spent quite a bit of discussion about including the image pyramid. So they do include the image pyramid. Um, I don't recall, and we'll look at it in a little more detail uh, as we go down the rest of the paper, whether they actually include encoder decoder, but um, my understanding, or at least is that they do, but I'm less certain about the encoder decoder. I'm 100% certain about the image pyramid because they spend quite some time in the paper discussing the inclusion. Yeah, it's just that, um, yeah, like when we come on to the V3 plus paper, Effectively, they're saying that their V3 model lacked the ability to have sort of fine, fine grained edge detection. And, and the way that they got around that was by adding in an encoder decoder similar to the UNET. Mm -hmm. So, like, it made it look as if that wasn't in the V3. Ah, okay. So maybe they didn't. That's why I was saying I'm less certain of the encoder decoder, I'm 100% certain of the image pyramid. So we'll okay. figure out whether, as we go through the rest, whether that's the, that, that they presented the idea, but they did not include it in the implementation, which is entirely possible. Okay. Okay, let's, and then of course, they talk about implementation details and with, as with anything else, in fact, it's kind of, you know, because there is some recent talk about should papers only get published, which are improving the state of the art. And I thought it was lame because one of the things they do in this paper is by literally get to SOTA by, by a 0.1 value greater than the previous 
and I was wondering whether they had to do that just to get this paper published, which would be ridiculous. But such is life. Um, and then, of course, they present the results. So, image pyramid. Uh, since this is one of the key ideas, um, as Rekil already mentioned, here it says small scale inputs encode the long range context. Uh, again, to define terms, I wish there was a glossary, but rate, as we already discussed, is the level by which the receptive field is stretched, or another way, as Rekel explained, is how many zeros between any two pixels that get sampled. Um, the scale is, think of it as values H by W. By H by W, I mean the height and the width of the image. Um, so that's what they mean by scale here. So um, that was again, that's again something that's not defined. I wish they defined it because then it makes it easier to grasp. Um, so, by the way, um, question for Steve Reckel or anybody else who has read the paper. If you see here, I say that um, I don't quite get why they say small scale inputs encode the long range context. Do they mean by this that the scale by scale and small scale they mean in the pyramid in the PSP net we saw the one two three six scale right the scale of one by one and then uh, that the one by one uh, convolution then a two by two scale a three by three scale and a six by six scale is that your understanding of what they mean because that was the only thing which makes sense you can take it one step back if you actually go up to the figures that you were sharing about image pyramid. There. So yeah, let's look at image pyramid just as image scale one, left hand side as it goes up. So basically what they're trying to say is that as you go up, like you mentioned, H by W keeps reducing, right? Right. As H by W keeps reducing, the top image is basically some encoded form of image scale one, the bottom image. The Correct. The image below that, uh, sorry, the layer below that, which has a slightly bigger H by W, yes, that one, is also an encoded form of the original image, but the scale is larger, but the context that it's looking at is smaller. Does that make sense? The context it is looking at is smaller because it's only looking at this rather than at this image? Uh, in terms of like, I would think it's because of the pooling layers that take part. Oh, how do I explain this? It kind of makes sense to me because like, as you go higher up on the scale, you basically, right. uh, sorry, higher in this diagram that is lower the scale, you're kind of looking at much more further parts, right? Like those things, the further parts. So yeah, actually, let's go back to the PSP net example where you remember the board yeah, was there. And yeah, the in fact, that's there. what I was there, right? So yeah. this is the small scale, correct? Yes. It is the small scale. And the context is the largest, right? Ah, so that's what I meant. That in this case, the scale is not H by W, but see, the definition is different because it is the scale of the convolution it's the one by one convolves which is the small scale not scale h by w scale see they switch the meaning of scale on me when they use the term and that's what frustrates me because my understanding of scale is h by w but here they use it in the context of this is a small scale which encapsulates a larger context while this is a larger scale which encapsulates a smaller context of this image. Do I make sense? Right. But uh, yeah, I think the way H by W for, to me makes sense is the resulting outputs H by W is smaller. Right? Because when you apply that one by one con, then it makes right. a difference, right? Versus that last six by six con, your resulting outputs, the H by Ws are like inversely proportional, right? Yeah. Okay. I see. So that's why I think I, both of us are saying the same thing. Same and thing, I guess, right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. But, but yeah, scale that's, is a term there, yeah, I guess. Right. But, you know, that's what confused me initially until I 
figured out that that's kind of what they're saying. They're saying, in other words, uh, if I can jump back, that this particular block in a PSP net, for example, which is a one by one convolve on this image, provides you the largest context of this image. Correct? Yep. Yeah. And so that's what this particular paragraph means. Uh, feature responses from the small scale inputs encode the long range context, while the large scale inputs preserves the small object details. And this is important because if you don't do this multiple scaling like PSPNet does, then you tend to miss out on the small objects in your original image by the time you get to the final image. And in fact, this is one of the reasons that the forwarding at different levels works in case of unit, right? That's the other way you get around this problem. Any questions? Okay, and then the encoder decoder is something we are all familiar with. Now, the only thing here is, um, uh, Rick, if you can sorry, send the just a link that you mentioned of all these different terms. Oh, yes, uh, yeah, I'll do that. Just to jump in before that, just to, I don't know if everyone is familiar with this context, but uh, even I think uh, Mehul mentioned this last time, the Laplacian pyramid idea. So if you think of an image, 256 by 256, anything you go smaller than that, you are, let's say you blur, you're basically blurring the image, right? Your resolution is becoming worse. So as you go down, what happens is you lose all the sharp edges and the sharp features. And once you do these convolutions, you're basically looking at only the smaller local information. But as you go down and down, the advantage is that you're getting a more global concept of what the image looks like. Um, and what you're losing as you go down is basically the finer edges and details. And that's like kind of the high frequency sort of terms that are there. So if you keep that in mind, then looking at these pyramids, the unit, all those things kind of make a lot more sense. That's what really helped me. So, so you're saying as we go in, as the, as we go deeper into the network, because the up and down varies with you. Yeah, like exactly. versus this. Yes, right. As we go deeper into the network, yes. you are losing the finer edge, the high frequency. That exactly. means the finer edges of the various images and stuff. Exactly. And in fact, you're also losing the small objects in that sense. Uh, right? that if an object exactly. is only like five pixels, you'd yep. be completely lost by the time you get you to... Right. Uh, the deep end of the network. Right, exactly. So that is the stuff that you're losing. But now imagine like what you were saying, uh, if you're going deeper, but if you subtract two consecutive layers, the information that you get is basically that the information that you lost from the previous layer, right? So Correct. that's where you get back your higher features, your hair, all those kind of finer detail things is what you can uh, retrieve back. That's what the Laplacian part is. Hmm. So keeping that in mind really helps understanding why this whole different scales going down on different rates, all these things kind of make sense because you're looking at different objects, different things at different scales and resolutions. Yeah. And the way I was also trying to recall is, you know, if you, if you go back to one of the original papers that tried to understand convolution, it, you know, and show it at different scales, it shows that the eyes and the ears and things like that get recognized much deeper. Whereas at the beginning, that is at the shallow layers, if you will, you recognize edges and lines and circles and things like that. And so in effect, what happens is that as you get into the deeper network, you, you know, again, uh, or what you're trying to do is provide uh the context of the full image in back into the deeper portions of the network right that's all all these four techniques are trying to do right yeah that this 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 example that you gave answers your previous question of uh, how you get larger context as you go kind of deeper sort of a thing yeah yeah correct because eyes, you're getting it, eyes and exactly exactly and things like that. Whereas in the shallower layers, all you're getting is 
lines and diagonal lines and vertical lines and circles and you know almost like the elements that build up your yeah, eye yeah, right yeah and you need both when you are kind of eventually trying to classify every pixel uh yeah right exactly so i think that is also mentioned in the paper somewhere that when you're doing classification the whole advantage of using convolution because it is invariant to where the object is the dog is on the top left bottom right you still want to classify it as a dog right. so classifying like that and reducing your resolution as you go down is totally fine but when you're doing something like segmentation you want to know exactly where the dog is where the dog's ear is so you need first of all to know that it's a dog and second of all you need all the is higher level information of where the edges are so that's why you need to somehow introduce that back in uh not uh, uh, to compensate for your redu reduction in size and all these max pooling operations that you're doing yeah 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 okay so this is you know just the deconvolution which is basically encoder decoder unit details and i think they can explain the laplacian pyramid reconstruction and then we talk about the context module this was one that uh you know didn't quite grasp as well as the i mean i understand at a high level but because and i made a mark to myself that i need to understand what the dense crf is if anybody else knows or it can explain it uh, that would be helpful i don't so i made a mark to myself saying i need to get uh i understand what that is and then um i didn't quite understand at this stage maybe we'll get it once we get into the detail of uh laying out certain things in cascade versus certain things in parallel and what that essentially means this i think is yeah just what the dense crf means uh because they apparently used dense crf in the previous version and didn't use it in the current version so i didn't want to waste my time trying to understand something which they don't seem to use going forward but still would be good to know anybody else able to chime in on that i i don't know the dense crf but the crf is the conditional random field right and i i've seen it um, yes that's that's what they say it means uh, may hold but what does conditional random field mean um uh, let me see if i can remember <laughs> um i've seen okay I, I, i'll try and see if i can find some notes on it like uh, i've seen it long time ago okay uh, no that's fine if you can even post links to it on slack yeah. later that would be helpful yeah. thanks yeah one, one, one thing interesting is this is the second place i there's another like uh, like a medical segmentation called uh, deep medic which is like we are finding it's doing a little better than unit and what they also have this con crf idea so you know like they have their deep learning part and then to kind of almost kind of do like local cleanup like the deep learning always has some noise and then uh, to uh, you know like so you have noisy outputs from the deep whatever deep learning model you have and then they go and they're like okay let me just go and attach this thing at the end and uh, it will it will help clean up that noise um, so maybe mm -hmm. it's able it's able to look at you know so for example say you are um, you are inside the liver right and and you your liver is label 10 right so and suddenly you you get a pixel called 100 which is supposed to be the heart so you know oh i shouldn't have a heart pixel inside my liver so this thing can go and you know clean uh, clean that up ah okay uh, yeah so they see in fact they say it that seems to somewhat explain it uh, right in because it's apparently a context module so that would explain hmm. like if the context is the liver then a heart shouldn't be there kind of right. clean up right. yeah. type yeah. but and that's done by adding convolutional layer on top of what they call belief maps and the belief maps are basically the uh, you know because finally when we segment the number of channels equals the number of classes we have right so the belief maps are the final deep convolution cnn feature maps that contain the output channels equal to the number of predicted classes and then they add these in order to clean up as you said so any reference to that so 
conceptually, it seems what you're saying is these dense conditional random fields are there in order to provide the context, maybe even linking to what Rekil said, maybe it says, hey, this is a dog, so you better not have a cat pixel in a dog image right. context or something to that effect. But how it does that uh, will, I guess, be clear if we understand tense here, which okay. is somewhat orthogonal to this, uh, or at least they don't employ it. So I didn't, but I made a note to myself that I need to gain some learning about that. And then the spatial pyramid, we have already talked about PSP net. It just captures context at several ranges. Again, <laughs> this is why it's frustrating, but by range, they now mean different what I, uh, what PSPNet calls scales, um, right? Meaning at different H by Ws or what we already saw. Um, and then this paper proposes the heterospatial pyramid pooling. So parallel atros convolutional layers with different rates, and then they capture multi-scale information. So not only are they applying the atros convolution to get, um, if I can go back, these different um, uh, <clears throat> you know, here this is applied to the image at different as Rekil was saying to the image at this scale to get this, a higher address rate is applied to this image in order to keep this size the same as this size. Uh, yet a higher address resolution is applied because as you can see on the left-hand side, the H by W keeps shrinking. And because you keep shrinking here, you need to keep compensating by increasing the address rate in order to keep this dimension the same from the lower dimensions the by smaller h by w that you get on the left is that correct Rickel? yeah that is my understanding too yeah so then the and this is where i was a somewhat uh, confused and maybe it will become clear um how they combine these different layers different atros convolutions uh, is something that we should watch out for as we go deeper into the paper. So then they come and of course, uh, see they say, and this is what maybe as we go deeper, all these things will resolve themselves. But here they say capture context at several ranges. By ranges, I would imagine that it is at different H by W or different, uh, right? Scale, but then yeah. they say pyramid scene parsing performs spatial pooling at several grid scales. And in fact, the PSP net paper just uses different scales. I think the grid um, scale is that one by one, two by two, three by Yeah, two, exactly. Yeah. So that different scales implies these, yeah. right? The yeah. one by one here, the two by two here, the three by three right. here, and the six by six there. I think PSP net calls it as pyramid sizes, I think. For some yeah. yeah. Pyramid scales, I think. But, okay. So, I said I was I think dying. The other thing I just wanted to mention there is that the parallel word there, I think, is you're looking at different starting image scales, right? You so mean, you're... yes. So, this is different, you're saying. No, uh, oh no, I was understanding it's a combination of A and C. So you do C, and that is at image scale one. Now you look at A, you change image scale one to image scale two, and then again you do C. That's what my understanding of parallel was. Right. Yes, you do the. Um, but what does parallel combination versus cascading and how so i do agree with you that what you're saying is this is just a atros convolution at one scale right, right. which yes. is for this scale of image H by you w. would right. potentially do atros convolution also at a H different by, instead of right. 256 by 256 at 128 by 128 scale. yeah that's what my understanding is yeah correct but then the question is you know um and of course, you could do the address convolution 
you know, in a way, it's also the pyramid pooling idea, right? Because basically this, if you do address convolution at different image scales, basically that's like doing the spatial uh, pyramid pooling, correct? Because, right, okay. yeah. right? Yep. The question in my mind is how do you combine all of these? So you would get, these are all the same size, mm -hmm. but when you do the address convolution at the next level down, then do you create the same size as this, or do you do a set of images and then upscale them to this size? Yeah, good question. Yeah, I'll have to look at it. You see what I'm... Yeah, I get what your question is. Yeah, either way, I would... I don't know which one is better, but yeah, both seem to at least give you back the same size so you can add them. Sort right, of. right. Yeah. So that's something I was just yeah, wondering sure. yeah. how the combination happens. Okay, and then... Um, Okay, so essentially what you and I were talking about is how do you use Etros convolution as a context module and a tool for spatial pyramid pooling, right? So you've done the Etros convolution that you need to do, let's say at one scale, but then you could use the same technique, do it at different scales and then combine them. That would be combining Etros with pyramid pooling, mm -hmm. right? So that's kind of what they are talking about as a context module and a tool for spatial pyramid pooling. So that's a fundamental idea in the sense that you could potentially apply this to any network. Basically duplicate several copies of the original uh, last block and arrange them in cascade and revisit the ASPP module, which contains several convolutions in parallel. Um, this is where I was somewhat lost because um, maybe do they have a, they, I wish they had a picture of what they, uh, well, they do, uh, which is here, but we'll get to this in a minute. Um, by the way, this should we question, should we, can we keep going for about maybe 15, 20 minutes or do people have to leave because that's a, it's a critical big point and then we'll need to get into the details and at least stop at a reasonable uh, point or we can stop here and get going on the paper uh, next week. Where are people, can people afford 15, 20 more minutes or? I'm good for 15 minutes, yeah. Okay, let's keep going then. And um, so, That I get, but what isn't clear, and maybe it will become clear as we go through the next is how, you know, it almost seems like they're saying that they duplicate the last block in ResNet and then arrange them in a cascade and combine it with the atrospatial pyramid pooling, which contains the atros convolutions in parallel. So it is what Rachel was talking about, which is you do this, but at multiple levels, is that uh, at multiple image? Um, a little transfer to the D diagram. And I feel like the first sentence is saying, do ResNet capture the last block? So that is the topmost blue thing before the merge and before the spatial pyramid molding. This guy. Yes. Or equivalent to this guy when you, or this, any one of these guys with, uh, or all of these guys, um, with one uh, level of image, right? With one, one H by W at one that right. end of the resonant block. Uh, e, ah, okay, I see what you're saying. Okay. I right? was thinking that it was, it says take the resonant block, last resonant block and copy them, right? Correct. So that's why I was thinking if you look at the last blue one there uh, in D, just this, below spatial pyramid pooling in D. That yeah. guy. Yeah, that guy. And that is, let's assume that's the last block. Yes. And then it says make, make copies. Duplicates. Yeah. So uh, you go, you, let's say we go horizontally like right. that with multiple copies of that. Right. And then for each of them, you do that special pyramid pooling is what I understood. Okay. Uh, but, but for each of these, he's saying do atros convolution, then spatially pyramid. Oh, ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Right. But then you do, if, if you're doing atros convolution at that point, you do atros convolution on that. This is only a single sized image, right? 
So why would you do it at different rates on this same sized image? That's the, I guess. Uh, okay, okay. I see now what I think it's uh, actually it's the figure below that you pointed at before. That makes sense now. Yeah. So now we have to, you know, in fact, switch figures to look right, at right. this guy. Yeah, that make yeah this one will make more sense because yeah so we get to uh, right. we we'll have to switch so in effect we come up I think and this figure in fact apologies but maybe regular somebody else can uh, this figure confused me more than it uh, explained at some level but um, you know we'll because I couldn't quite understand where the rates of the atrial convolutions are applied and uh, so on. But let's come to that figure in just a minute. So, um, and then he says that they are applied directly on the feature maps instead of the belief maps. Now remember that the belief maps are the ones which have the final number of filters equal to the number of classes. So we are at the layer of the ResNet where we have not yet converted the number of feature, uh, the, num, uh, the channels to be equal to the number of classes. We are one step before that. That's what I understood by saying that. Yeah, belief maps, I think, comes from that deep belief networks and deep belief networks, if you kind of in summary is basically if you know what a like an auto encoder is you start with let's talk about a simple neural network so you start with let's say 10 uh, neurons and the whole idea is you want to compress 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 so 10 neurons will become eight neurons eight will become four four will become two and then you again go back up two will become right. four four will become eight eight will become ten and the whole idea of this is like you're kind of encoding information and just trying to hold on to the most important thing uh, so your final 10 neurons should be as close as possible to initial 10 neurons. And that is the belief map. You're believing that your last 10 is the closest to your initial 10. Right. So and in like, fact, here they define belief maps as kind of the final maps that contain output channel equal to the number of predicted classes. Correct. Exactly. So that's what right. your belief is. Yes, right. Right. So, but what they're saying here is the cascaded modules are applied directly on the feature maps instead of on the belief maps. Correct. So instead of going all the way down, right. that's where you stop. Uh, the same thing with the spatial pyramid, right? We did that features by eight, some size like that we chose. Correct. Correct. And we did, we had one more convolution left to do before we got the original back and stuff. Uh, right. So, yeah. Something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So we had to upscale again from the one eight to get back. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, now, and then obviously they talk about the fact that batch norm was a big, um, improvement. And then, ah, this is where, they also, to Steve's question, this is where they augment ASPP with image level features. And that's the image pyramid that we'll get into in a minute. Um, so it was convolution, they define it. This is where they defined as Rekel explained. It's in between you introduce enough zeros so that you sample every, uh, every rate, Pixel. That is, if rate is six, you sample every six pixel in both dimensions. And then they define one other very important term, which is critical. Output stride is the ratio of the input image spatial resolution to final output resolution. So if you take, for example, your image is 256 by 256, and if your um, your input image is 256 by 256 spatial resolution, that is H by W, and your final output is one by one, just to simplify, then your output stride is 256. That's what this means. So if you're out, if on the other hand, your output is four by four and your uh, input is 256 by 256, then it is what, 64? Yeah, uh, 64. So that's what, so in effect, they are saying if your output before the fully connected layers of global pooling is 32 times smaller than your output stride is 32. And if on the other hand, it's 16 times smaller than the output stride is 16, right? 
And obviously, the other important thing is if you like to double the spatial density of computed features, then the output stride is 16. Because um, if your stride is smaller, that actually means that the density is higher. Because if the output stride is bigger, that means you have shrunk the output more compared to the input. Which basically is in correlation with the term stride. The bigger the stride, you're jumping more. So you're yeah. taking less pixels and conversely the other way around. Yeah, so it's smaller and you're losing more. Right. Uh, if it's smaller stride, you're taking getting more, right? Oh, yeah, they, uh, sorry, yeah. the other way, yes. Stride of last pooling or convolution layer that decreases resolution is set to one. The void decimation. Um, and then this is the part that I didn't quite get either. Um, the, and maybe we have to defer it until we get to the picture below. But they talk about the stride of the last pooling or convolutional layer that decreases resolution is set to one to avoid signal decimation. And then they say all subsequent convolutional layers are replaced with atros convolutional layers having rate r equal to. And I didn't understand this. I wish they'd shown a picture, but maybe we should hold on to this particular paragraph and trying to understand it. And we'll, we go look at the diagram below. Anybody else who has read this um, have any explanation? If, if not, let's keep moving. And you know, if you read it and feel that you understand that particular paragraph, I didn't, uh, please feel free to comment or add to my comments. Um, so, now, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say, like, should we jump on next time, like with that diagram? Because I, 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 I read this paper a while back. <laughs> it made sense. <laughs> I've looked at some code. So I was just wondering, can we, I think this is a good stopping point. Yeah, me. no, this is a good stopping okay. point because it requires quite a bit of context to get this diagram right. uh, ingested. And then we'll be spending a, a, quite a bit of time understanding this diagram and also the details uh, vary. So my request would be for people to read through this paper and if possible, also the next paper that uh, Steve uh, posted, because I think the change from here to the next paper would uh, be fairly small as my imagination. Steve, maybe you can chime in how uh, different or more complicated it is compared to the previous one. If you look at that diagram there that you're looking at the bottom of the middle. Yes. Yeah. So what I thought was, as you can see, like in the, in the A diagram, it's their spatial pyramid pooling. Right. Um, and yeah, so I just thought they had spatial pyramid pooling combined with atros pooling, but like then they said that they weren't getting sharp edges. And so effectively what they've done now is merge in part of the encoder decoder architecture. They haven't done the whole full thing. They've done sort of just taking one level. So they end up with the picture in C is their final V3 plus model, mm. which is why I thought that they didn't have encoder decoder in V3 by itself. Mm. Interesting. Okay. So I think if you can, um, what I found is they tend to refer to their own um, previous paper so it would I would imagine that they should be very incremental or at least I don't know about the very part but incremental to each other so would recommend people read rethinking atros as well as encoder decoder and we can start as Rekul suggested with this diagram or at least uh, you know going deeper with atros convolution next uh, week. Yeah, this paper seems to have all the possible things that you could do in segmented, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. That's what makes it uh, interesting. Um, uh, challenging part is I wish they had defined the terms and stuff and included more pictures. Yeah, and, pictures, I agree, because there's so many branchings happening in different Yeah, at the same time, and how they combine, and you know that isn't very clear, and you have to go deeper before you understand previous concepts and stuff. And that makes it a hard read. Well, but it's 
you know, one, as you said, if we understand this paper, I think we'll be familiar with most of the techniques used and then hopefully HRNet is just incremental to this, but HRNet seems to get uh, the very best results in a lot of benchmarks too. Yeah, that was a much quicker read because of the diagrams and there's no multiple branches happening. Yeah, they explain it better too. Yeah. Some people just do a better job of building your foundations and then putting the pieces together. This one is all over the place. Yeah, I don't know if it's because they have two previous papers that you they assume you probably know. Yeah, know maybe. That's another reason, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, a quick side note is that the library that you shared last time, the ARGS is whichever the, uh, the geographic uh, uh, site one, that has PSPNet's code, PSPNet with a unit's code, PSP, uh, DeepLab V3, all those codes are there and In it fact, should be with FastAI V1 compatible sort of a thing. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, or... I can see it, yeah. Uh, oh, this, the... Yeah, okay. Seeing this library. Mm -hmm. Is this the one you're talking about? No, this is not the one. Uh, you had, uh, let me see, Arxis or something. Oh, yeah, the, uh, I have seen that, but I had problem running it the first time. So then I kind of gave up. No, it's the one I've been using. Yeah, so yeah, like this it, is the one that Steve uses, I think. Oh, yeah, I like okay. it, it ties closely into the Catalyst library. And plus as well, it seemed to be like everybody, all of the uh, winners of the competition, this is what they used. Oh, cool. Okay, uh, I'm probably. And in fact, this one uh, is fairly simple. I didn't, you know, so it's, you know, much to Jeremy's liking, I think, because it's like one page of code. That's it for PSP.NET. Right. And of course, that is because they define is that is that like a, a, a vanilla version of the v, PSP net that the, 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 then I think the I found a bunch of PSP net codes online but they had that massive upsample in the end which does that 8x upsample uh -huh. which, which everyone writes about is inefficient so there's no point Correct. of really kind of going through that the link that I shared is the one you used last time and I think Steve also pointed out that he had seen that uh, oh just, yeah, the arts is okay. I, yeah. I, I I recall that. Yes, and yes, they yes. use a lot of FastAI V1 in their code, so a lot yes. of the chunks of code are same. So it's very similar to the unit, like model size is used, feature size is used. So I was hoping that I'll be able to get that into V2, but yeah, it's taking longer than I expected. Mm. Okay, so yes, I I remember that link uh, that you're referring to now, and yeah, we can if you can just repost that. I I uh, yeah, on Slack that as well, and I'll post this one the link to this and so we can you know at least a couple of things to work on next week is try to get the segmentation model working i'll fiddle around with some other submissions just to see how things are going and uh, try to meet try to at least match mr bannister who is now run the four minute mile several weeks back and uh, i'm still struggling at 0 0.87 0 0.88 so I need to give him a better run. <laughs> then, I need uh, to improve a bit more to keep ahead of you. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, if you can read the uh, Deep Lab V3, uh, the one we were discussing, as well as the one that Steve sent out, which is the actual V3 Plus. So we can finish that next week. Okay.